for first sight attachment and what it means to be human. And it's myself, Ken Fuchsman, and Dr. Rosenschmidt. And I'll be going first, and then she will follow. And then directly after our sessions are over, then Dr. Susan Cavalier will be presenting. And then after that, there's a cancellation, so we're going to do an improvised thing on a community dialogue on Donald Trump. He's not an analyst <laughs> <laughs> or a psycho historian. <laughs> but we're going to be doing stuff on him. Brian, Agustin, and I will each talk about five minutes and then moderate whatever discussion we have. <clears throat> Is coming through. Yes. All right. <clears throat> so what I'm going can I move the show a little bit? Nope. Yes, not. All right. All right. Well, yeah. Just it slides over the line a little more. Okay. Okay. Cooperation and conquest, mm -hmm. benevolence and betrayal. We cannot survive without killing for food. Dropping our homes. <laughs> we cannot survive without cooperation. Okay. We cannot survive without killing for food, having sex, nurturing our children, and helping each other out. There are a wide variety of conceptions of what being human means. Below is part of my lengthy inquiry to our species. I focus on how talented individuals embedded within cultures. As homo sapiens, we have gone from stone tools to smartphones, from superstition to science, from helpless infants to self-actualized adults, from being illiterate to Shakespeare, from bows and arrows to Hiroshima and Auschwitz. How did genius and duplicity, expertise and exploitation emerge from inside human to so alter life and death on planet Earth? I begin at a beginning. The coming into being of a human is through physical interconnections to a female. Within the womb, the fetus comes, if not into consciousness, into experience. Unless there is a surrogate, the child's first attachment is literally to its biological mother. Attachment is a part of the human condition of our long childhood dependence, and is connected to the question of, what is it to be a person? From conception to weaning, humans share a physiological intimacy with their mother. The sustenance the fetus receives comes from her body. This makes for a privileged relationship, not necessarily smooth, but primal. There is a form of union, however complicated, between mother and fetus. This initial connectedness has consequences. A pregnant woman who consumes too much liquor risks the baby developing fetal alcohol syndrome. Obstetrician Peter Nathaniels writes, babies who have developed in unfavorable conditions before birth are more prone to heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and altered stress responses during life after birth. Males born at less than 5.5 pounds are 50% more likely to die of heart disease than men who weigh 9.5 pounds at birth. During pregnancy, if a mother has been depressed, her newborn infant may suffer from inconsolable, excessive crying. In some species, newborn imprint upon the first object they encounter. Homo sapiens, on the other hand, are predisposed to be bonded with their biological mother. Newly born infants have preference for their own mother's voice over the vocalization of other females, but don't have preference for their own father's voice over other males. An indication of the infants being drawn to the mother is that newborns have a strong preference towards the smell of their own mother's amniotic fluid. And another is that within hours after birth, infants also develop a preference for the smell of their own mother's milk compared to the milk of another 21-page paper that I've reduced by million, so I'm going to skip around and miss some of what I crossed out. Biological anthropologist Michael Ann Park writes, humans are born even more helpless than other primates. A human baby Allison Jolly writes, 
needs almost a year to achieve the motor control of a newborn chimpanzee. And of course, we have the longest childhood dependency of any species. Cultures devote substantial resources to providing for children. Homo sapiens do not only rely on mothers to nurture the newborn. Alice and Jolly again, that says humans differ from all other apes, we are cooperative breeders. This means we share childcare. Our cooperative breeding goes beyond the biological parents and may bring in grandmothers, siblings, aunts, daycare nannies, and an entire community. Other primate mothers, Alice and Jolly again, says maybe superb single parents, but we grew out of single parenthood as a preferred strategy around two million years ago, and I remember that well. <laughs> so whether a mother gives birth to one child or twins, or whether the baby is cared for by one or multiple caregivers, biology predisposes these infants to become bonded to their caregivers. Physician and anthropologist Melvin Connor declares that attachment is wired into the infant's brain. Essentially, attachment is an instinct, an unlearned behavior pattern. And, but attachment is just one stage of human development, which also includes cooperation, empathy, individuation, caring, desire, <coughs> love, self-identity, and these are accompanied by separation, disconnection, misunderstanding, symbiosis, hostility, attachment, hate, identity, and diffusion. Our human paradoxes have a number of roots, and certainly a prominent one is the complicated interpersonal relationships that we have from womb to, to demise. As embodied beings, humans need sensitive touch from an attuned caregiver to flourish. The quality and sensitivity of the caressing, as well as if the baby is held and responded to, are essential. Being sentient and sensual is integral to how we connect to each other. And being touched with care can help us be receptive and open to the wonder of the world around us. Because these connections are so central, removing the infant from proximity to caregivers causes anxiety. Across all human cultures and even some primate species, Jeffrey Simpson and Jay Belsky write, young and vulnerable infants tend to display specific sequences of reactions following separation from their stronger, older, and wiser caregivers. Immediately after separation, infants often protest vehemently, crying, screaming, throwing temper tantrums as they search for their caregivers. Others may nurture the infant. Among the Ethi of Zambia, at birth, the newborn is suckled by other adult females in addition to the mother. Child rearing is the responsibility on the average of 14.2 adult caregivers in the first 18 weeks. In this communal setting, during the day, nurturing responsibilities are dispersed, but at night, only the mother takes care of that. At six months, Infants begin to show preference for the care of their own mothers, and they're more likely to be carried by their mothers on trips out of the camp and to protest against their leaving. Hazen and Zeitman declare, even where multiple attachments are the norm, attachment figures are not treated equivalently. An infant reliably seeks and maintains proximity to one. An infant shows clear discrimination among caregivers and a consistent preference for the primary caregiver. Among the Hausa, a large African ethnic group, infants appear to be attached initially to three or four primary figures, but most are primarily attached to one. Importantly, the principal figure is not necessarily the mother who is solely responsible for feeding but rather the person who holds and otherwise interacts with the infant the most. Toma Umamura and colleagues report that infants who are securely attached to their father, but not their mother, may prefer their father even though their mother is the primary caregiver. What we find is that the preference of the child becomes important 
that infants focus on one figure is most important, and this need not be their mother or other primary caregiver, but the person with whom biological relatives, the chimpanzees, the number of whom are registered at this conference. Chimpanzees <laughs> have a multi-male, multi-female mating system. During estrus, females mate with multiple males, sometimes five within an hour, and rarely form pair bonds. The mothers, along with their offspring, exclusively care for their babies. Neither males nor the larger group of chimpanzees are involved in child care. Um, our babies, on the other hand, as I said, select one figure. In groups of humans, human friends, it is not infrequent for a child to have a best friend. Homo sapiens are also different than most other animals in forming lasting pair bonds. Less than 10% of mammals are monogamous, and only 15 to 29% of primate species favor living together as couples, though far fewer commit to monogamy, as humans know. <laughs> so by and large, humans organize their mating systems around favoring one partner over others. While multiple marriages exist for many for some in many societies, infidelity is certainly quite common, and there are humans of both sexes who favor multiple partners. Most human adults have been married and wed to one person at a time. Unlike chimpanzees and most primates, and even more mammals, humans most often carry forth that preferring one attachment figure over others from infancy to adulthood. Though there are many infant characteristics that are not evident in adulthood, for our species, either throughout life, or this, or this preference is resumed once sexual attraction rears its head. Family also is a human universal, and marriage is a near universal, existing in all societies except one, um, the Na of China. China. It's the only society we know of, writes historian Stephanie Humes, where marriage is not a significant institution. Human attachment, okay. Another thing is that in adult romantic attachments, some of you may have heard sexual jealousy is actually happens. Um, I never experienced it myself, but they say it's a human universal. And so this also, it's equivalent to the separation fears of early life stages. And according to anthropologist Melvin Connor, sexual jealousy is a human universal. So human attachment practices and preferences stemming from infancy have significant consequences for the way humans interact with each other at all stages of life. Bonds and rivalries originate in families and extend to the conflict and violence present in larger social organizations. These complementary, contradictory tendencies have their roots in the centrality of being attached to one caregiver at a young age and then fearing loss and being jealous of rivals from siblings to others. Our attachment and the complex human emotions it arouses in many ways helps account for the cooperativeness and benevolence found among us, as well as the fury and rage also present in all known human societies where homicide is a human, ver a human universal. Much of what perplexes humans has its origins in certain psychological characteristics inherent in our species. <coughs> Anthropologists and some psychologists are very critical of attachment theory. They feel often that it is culturally biased, that it universalizes what we favor in Western culture into other societies. So in a volume called Attachment Reconsidered, Suzanne Gaskins discusses a Yucatan mining <coughs> infant that they may interact with 25 different people in one day. In money cultures, infants are never without a familiar caregiver around. In such cultures, separation is, anxiety is rarely triggered by circumstances. In another book related to this, called Substitute Parents, Joachim Benzel reports that a Berlin daycare center 
that among one-year-old children, about two-thirds of them exhibited separation anxiety in their first day. So this type of attachment pattern and temperament may, the temperament may have contributed to whether or not they exhibited strongly negative emotions. If he is correct, then there might be factors other than separation that are important in whether separation anxiety is exhibited. So, so that, and also attachment figures originally didn't think that temperament had much to do with the pattern of attachment, just the way the mothers behave, but then that changes. So we now see that the temperament and personalities of the infant and primary caregiver or caregivers interact to form a relationship, and these patterns take time to deform, are connected to the child's cognitive development, as it takes a while for the brain to develop. By nine months old, infants can be content, attuned, satisfied, smile, cry, be anxious, angry, insecure. Our capacity to be strongly emotional is evident, while other cognitive abilities are still forming. The early attachment relationship is an emotional one. Philip Rochad's research confirms that probably from birth, infants have the core ability to differentiate between self and non-self stimulation. Rather than being absolutely separate from their environment, they are tuned to it from the outset. And at age seven months, Alan Shore writes, children can categorize certain facial changes, expressions, effects. It is not until 10 months that the infant's able to construct abstract prototypes of human visual patterns. Daniel Stern says that infants begin to experience a sense of an emergent self from birth. They never experience a period of total self-other differentiation. There is no confusion between self and other. Overlapping with object permanence is this development of the self that Stern writes about. He says from two to six months, infants consolidate the sense of a core self as a separate, cohesive, <coughs> bounded physical unit with a sense of their agency, affectivity, and continuity in time. So it's in this period of time that they're developing a sense of self that then it manifests itself in how they choose a primary caregiver over multiple caregivers and how they can distinguish between their mothers and other caregivers and choose a primary attachment figure who is not their mother or other primary caregiver. So, then to understand the attachment process, we need to look at the cognitive, cognitive level, temperament, the sense of self, and the other predispositions and traits of infants. Because some newborns are clearly more attuned and aware, some more intelligent and perceptive, some more physically coordinated, expressive, and self-regulated than others. There are degrees of awareness, perceptiveness, and intelligence in both infants and their adult caregivers. Some babies and mothers have greater emotional intelligence than others, and it is this degree of responsiveness and perception that is also part of the developing relationship relationships. As each child is predisposed to develop specific talents, if there's a facilitating environment. <coughs> How attuned and responsive caregivers are to the aptitudes and talents of the child from birth on is crucial to an individual's development. These propensities help us make us who we are. All of these factors connect in some way to the attachment relationship. Another central factor in attachment is the cultural imperatives that impact on how the mother interacts with infants. Childbearing follows cultural directives. There are many societies which discourage maternal sensitivity to the child's needs and train the child to be less demanding and expressive. Anthropologist Stanley Kurtz reports in Hindu childbearing, a mother <coughs> behaves towards her child in a way to gently push him away from the relationship with her and towards the family at large. There is an intentional lack of individualized empathy between mother and child in these cultures, the absence of smiling response and feeding that is not carefully calibrated to the child's precise emotional state. 
anthropologist Jeanette Mar Maria Maggio recommends that attachment researchers pay attention to the underside of attachment system. This means observing cultures where distancing practices prevail. And this means that as a result, either children can be encouraged to curtail their emotions, or it can result in intensifying children's rage, frustrate their dependency needs, and create insecure boundaries. For child rearing, For child rearing involves individual psychology, the dynamics of dyadic relationships, and how infant nurturing is a cultural phenomenon. In many cultures, the mother of a newborn is not exclusively devoted to child care. Given that collaborative breeding is common, Harvard and biological anthropologist Karen Kramer says that cross-cultural time allocation data shows that infants typically receive about 50% of their care from mothers. As attachment theory underestimates some of these family <laughs> settings, cultural values, and child rearing patterns, it needs to supplement them to be more fully rounded. We also need to see how human personality and identity, various traits, talents, and limitations unfold within the family and cultural environments. How the self, with its imagined how the self with its imagination, identifications, identity, and interests develop in and outside the family needs to be addressed. This will include your already mentioned developmental attributes of attachment, separation, etc. What we want is a full portrait of what it means to be human, from attachment to individuation, from infantile dependency to more mature bonding, from imitation to innovation, from creativity to genius and more. The studying of attachment leads us to an understanding of how temperament, inclination, agency, self, and aptitudes interact in folding dyads and larger relationships. And so that if we the study then of attachment, because it brings in all these other important characteristics of being human, then sets a model for what else we need to examine to move to the next stages, that we can't leave out the role of temperament, the agency of the infant, the way that society adapts to that. The sense that we, that humans, unlike most of our closest relatives, are more prone to keep attachments, one attachment from infancy, and then at least resuming in adulthood. And that this then is something that all cultures need to adapt to, and that in a certain sense our psychology and emotional patterns developing at infancy are very important for understanding how culture works and what it means to be human. Thank you. So Peter will present and then afterwards we can have a discussion. Well, thank you for being here. Um, okay, I will be using slides. So, uh, my part is understanding the parent child bonds and attachment theory through the prism of neurobiology. Um, since I'm a neurologist and neurorehabilitation specialist trained in psychoanalysis, I kind of combine both spheres of trying to see things through the prisms not through the theory, particular theory, but through the prism of neurobiology, through the prism of attachment, you know, attachment theory or phenomena. Um, so it won't be just following one, one theory or the other. So um, although Bowlby was the one inventing or kind of using the word attachment, the colloquial word attachment that he didn't mean in, in, the, in, you know, in the sense that we use in a regular you know, life, um, he actually meant an, an, an attachment phenomenon is, uh, attachment is something that is a function of the parent, a function of the caregiver that is getting triggered by a uh, threat to the well-being of the child or of the cured one. Okay, so um, although Winnicott and, and, and Bowlby didn't really cooperate on that, but since Winnicott was a pediatrician and he was dealing with real, not internal mothers or fathers, 
and internal world only, but also with the real mothers that were depressed, that were that were um, um, that were left alone because of the war, you know, alone to, to take care of children, and they, you know, sometimes were not in the workforce, so they were whether depressed or were going into pieces, and, and, and you know, so he was looking at those couples, mothers and, and mother-child couple, and um, and he was saying in individual emotional development, the precursor of the mirror of the mother is the mother's face. What does the baby see when he or she looks at the mother's face? I'm suggesting that ordinarily what the baby sees is himself or herself. In other words, the mother is looking at the baby and what she looks like is related to what she sees there. So the baby doesn't know yet who he or she is, but the mother's eyes are telling the baby that the baby is loved or not, the baby is cared for or attended for or not. And that's how the self is created in, in terms of um, who we are. Um, many studies and statistics show that there are very high incidence of childhood issues such as unresolved childhood neglect, unprocessed loss, and abuse, all the code words for childhood trauma among those who seek psychotherapy. The issues we encounter in these patients vary from severe obsessive compulsive attitude to self-worth, self-esteem, relationship problem, to personality disorders, or to psychosomatic illnesses, just to name a few scenarios. Uh, you see here Morris Sendiak, who was a children book author and illustrator who died a few years ago, um, once said, childhood is a very, very tricky business of surviving it, because if one thing goes wrong, or anything goes wrong, and usually something goes wrong, then you are compromised as a human being. You're going to trip over that for a good part of your life. That quote kind of sat in my heart, and I remember it for the rest of my life probably, because this is, you know, the, the this is the heart of what we're talking about. Um, then Christopher Wallace, uh, in his Shadow of the Object Psychoanalysis of the Unthought Known, he said, the child, tra child traumas are not experienced as events in life, but as life-defining. Because we have events, yes, we adults have events. Children don't experience events, you know, whatever is happening, this is what the norm is, yes, so they get used to the norm, that kind of norm. So the unthought known, what he's he was talking about is that as infants we are informed by many ideas conveyed through action rather than thinking that become part of our unconscious because we are preferable at that time. So themes, I don't know if I will touch upon everything that I was planning to, but um, and of course you remember morning and melancholia, does the shadow of the object fell upon the ego, you know, so that's what, you know, the, you know, our, um, you know, attachments start there, um, in a big sense, and not, not in a particular sense that, you know, both of us use me. Um, so why the neuroscience lens? I don't think that I need to, you know, kind of, sell you the why and what, you know, um, why we use neuroscience now, because a lot of things that we are doing in the consulting room with our patients can be actually proven, can be understood better with the, you know, discoveries in neuroscience. And in his 1895, so before his interpretation of dreams, letter to Fries, Freud wrote, I am tormented by two aims, to examine what shape the a theory of mental functioning takes if one introduces a sort of economics of nerve forces, and second, to peel off from psychopathology a gain for normal psychology. So only knowing psychopathology, we actually can gauge what, psych what norm is could be. Uh, okay, and of course, you know, I, have, I like a lot of quotes because they're kind of like food for uh, you know, for thought, and I will not read all of them, but uh, Jonas Salk, uh, Dr. Jonas Salk, I love that quote, 
and it's it's kind of more on a general hum humanistic you know level but um, I love it no matter what um, good parents give their children roots and wings roots to know where home is wings to fly away and exercise what's been taught them and sometimes we need to learn from our uh, you know friends from other species how to be parents for example chimps they teach their babies social skills. Um, um, so the parenting strategy is patience that sometimes humans don't have. Uh, for example, the whales. Um, the baby humpback whales nurse around the clock. Uh, usually it's only one offspring. And parenting strategy is extreme attention that we sometimes don't have given enough to our children. Um, mute swans, they are aggressive defenders, so they are protectors. And sometimes we don't protect our children in the way we need to. Uh, giraffes, they, uh, they have actually social kindergartens, so they kind of, they have this socializing going on. And clownfish, it's death defining tenant, the host um, are the sea animals, and it's thousands of offsprings. Um, the childhood is only six to ten days and the parenting strategy is very toxic home that we don't want to learn from but a lot of homes are toxic in humans. Um, this is a little essay I wrote about the neurobiology of parenting and I will read you know, a little bit of it. Um, how much do parents matter in child's life? What does, uh, what roles do they play? It's in, is it enough just to have two fairly good human beings as parents for any particular child, not to be compromised, as Maura Sindak put it? If parents do matter, what uh, does their innate genetic or their environmental interaction-based influence matters the most in terms of same old nature versus nurture dilemma? Ronald Fairburn, Harry Guntrip, Don Winnicott, John Balby, Renee Spitz, Rolanda Tora, just to name a few, would not be considered immediate collaborators. But this group has one unifying identifier. They understood, each in their own way, that one's genetic pool gets excited, turned on and off, and modified by interaction with the other. In the first months and years of our lives, that other is our, our parents. Winnicott famously said that there is no such thing as a baby, and also that the baby only would know about him or herself by looking in the mother's eyes. John Balby attachment theory was a new type of instinct theory, as, as Balby called it. Theory of relational bonds as a primary human instinct. Attachment is not the same as bonding. Attachment describes the secure base function of the parent, which is not the same and not substituted by the parent's role as caregivers, playmates, teachers, disciplinarians. The function of attachment is being activated when child's feeling of security is threatened by pain, trauma, illness, or any other threat of pride. Child develops a behavioral response to each particular caregiver depending on the caregiver's way of responding to child's needs for protection. And by age six months, there can be identified one of these responses. So on the top, there is just notes, um, so we will know what it is. The organized means predictable by the child. Uh, atypical means frightened, dissociated, sexualized, or otherwise atypical. Uh, most atypical caregivers have some sort of unresolved mourning, trauma, or abuse. Disorganized behavior looks bizarre or contradictory. The source of child security is also the source of his or her frustration and fear. I mean, mom, mom or whoever is there, you know, the, uh, uh, the person, the caregiver. So now, by the quality of caregiving, it can be sensitive and sensitive and atypical caregiving. So if we have sensitive and loving quality of caregiving, child's strategy will be organized. What organized means? It's predictable. Child knows 
how the parent will react to whatever is going on or whatever the parent will be doing. The type of attachment that is built is secure and psychopathological problems, usually none, because this is actually a protective um, type of um, caregiving against the psychopathology. Now, after that, there is more already pathology coming. If the quality of caregiving is insensitive and rejecting, the child's strategy still or is organized because what? Because the child knows what to expect. And the type of attachment is insecure avoidant, and psychological problems usually are adjustment problems. If the quality of caregiving is insensitive and consistent, the child's strategy is already is also organized because child knows what to expect. But the type of attachment is insecure resistant, and the psychological problems will be social and emotional disorders. If the quality of caregiving is atypical, the child's strategy then will be disorganized because the child doesn't know what to expect. And the type of attachment will be the worst of, of all of them, is insecure, disorganized. And these people, these children and then adults, have the more severe psychopathology. So if, you know, like his scientists like to put everything in the graphs and, you know, so if we put um, on the X um, uh, the anxiety level, the high anxiety to the right, low anxiety to the left, and avoidance, you know, low avoidance meaning more connection, it's going north, and the high avoidance, low connection going south, then we will have the preoccupied, the fearful avoidant, the dismissing avoidant, and the secure um, style of attachment. And here, you, know, you don't have to remember all those, because we have a very cute cartoon that will, you know, I was not brought up here, you probably all were brought up here, so it's more close to home, you know. So this is the Charlie Brown. So the Charlie Brown is the fearful one. The child, Charlie Brown, has high anxiety of abandonment and low pro proximity seeking. The, the Charlie Brown child doesn't want a, too much connection and has a very high anxiety uh, of abandonment. The Lucy, Lucy Van Pelt, she has high proximity seeking. She wants to be with people. She wants to connect, yes? But she does have very high anxiety of abandonment. What about little Schroeder? He is on low proximity seeking, he doesn't need people, and he is on a low exam you know, anxiety of abandonment. He doesn't, he doesn't care being abandoned. He is preoccupied with his stuff, yes? So that's little Schroeder. The peppermint patty is the best. She has the secure attachment style. So she has high proximity seeking, she likes people, she likes communicating, and she has low anxiety of abandonment. Um, I don't have time to go over, you know, if anybody wants slides, I will email. Um, so I will just try to go to, you know, slides that, you know, kind of will, you will remember for a long time, yes? So the, this is the MRI, how much do I have? Mm -hmm. Ten? Ten? Okay. All right, so the three, okay, fine. So thank you. Um, so here is the CAT scan actually of a three-year-old child, three-year-old children. One is a normal so-called child with a normal development and no trauma. And on the right side is a child with the extreme neglect. So this is how the brain development, you know, like if we don't make connections, if we don't grow our, you know, um, neurons in our synapses, then, then the matter will not be growing. So the matter will be small. So this is very extreme. Um, so this is a little bit about Bolby, but again, we don't have time for that because I do want to get to the neural lens. As I said, like, I like to talk about neural lens. And on the left side, we have a cartoon for the triune brain, so-called, that uh, was an invention of Paul McLean. He was a 
neuroscientist, neurologist. He would be called social neurologist these days, but he's not here anymore. Um, and he came up with this triune brain theory um, where he said that there is a reptilian brain in each of us, you know, and neurologically it's represented by the brain stem, so it's the very core, it's very hard to change. And that's the part that is connected to our body and the bodily functions and the bodily reactions and the physical reactions when we have them, you know, and the trauma, like the childhood trauma likes to, because that's the oldest part, the childhood trauma likes to, you know, get a shortcut there. Then the, he called the limbic system that, you know, that is a, you know, a substrate for the limbic system. Yes, it was like um, a part of the brain that we call limbic system. But he called it mammalian brain. And as all mammals, we like to cuddle, we like to uh, kiss and lick and, uh, you know, and, and feed with milk. You know, so, and that's all connected to the emotions, and that's why the limbic system is involved. And then the neocortex is a human brain. It's a thinking brain, analyzing brain, deciding brain. So we all have all three levels. We all have the three floors, yes? But if somebody gets traumatized, you know, they, their mind goes on a shortcut, only on the level of the reptilian brain that has amygdala there and processing fear. Or if somebody is like only seeking pleasure, pleasure principle seeking, yes, they are living mostly in mammalian brain. They don't want to use, they have the third floor, the thinking and analyzing brain, but they really, their mind goes on the shortcut there. Okay, so why to talk about Science, we don't have time to go over those quotes, but the like the pretty nice quotes. So but this is very important. So the principle that Paul McLean was basing his idea on, and he actually developed the idea of triune brain, and I call it the functional neurology. I like the idea because it can be applied to psychological problems. Um, he developed the idea in 1960s, but he only published it in 1990 because for 30 years he was poo pooed, you know, you know, like because he couldn't prove anything, and because he was not a therapist, he couldn't have like a base of patients or of vignettes that he could base everything on. But here we are, and so. So his triune brain is actually based on, on the very well-known um, phrase coined by Heckel, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. As, as you see, when we are in our mother's womb, we are growing the hind brain, the green one, that becomes the lizard brain, and then the, the pink one becomes the limbic system and the mammalian brain. And then the forebrain, or the thinking brain, or the human brain, or the cortex, is a blue one that covers the whole brain, yes? So when we come out of our mother's womb, we already have all three levels, all of us. You know, if we don't have, you know, something, that means that intrauteral problem or stroke or something like that. But if we don't have any problems like that, that means that we born with all three levels. And you see, how this cartoon of the embryo the, is corresponding very well with the cartoon of the uh, driving brain by Paul McLean. So here is uh, what's happening. In the lizard brain, we have brain stem and cerebellum, and also the amygdala. That's the only part of the limbic system that is functionally relates to lizard brain. <coughs> so it's it's working on autopilot. We don't think about work, you know, how to work that part. It goes on autopilot, and we are involved in the fight and flight reaction. So this is what it is. The fear, amygdala processing fear, and we are involved in fight and flight. Then the next level, the purple, is mammalian brain, limbic system, neurolo neurological substrate. But psychologically, what we involve their emotions, memories, habits, yes? because the hippocampus is also in the mammalian level, on the mammalian level. And the human brain is a neocortex, the three millimeters of the gray matter that covers the whole 
brain that is actually making all decisions on the on the most mature level, um, you know, con you know, conscious decisions. So language, abstract thought, imagination, consciousness live there. And the mode of operation is reason and rush rationale. So this is like from fuel cells in the mother's womb, how we develop the, you know, all the layers that we need. But one interesting thing, in somebody's presentation I heard that something about touching and using the skin as part of the, you know, uh, part of, you know, therapeutic process. And it's very interesting that our uh, brain and skin, they come from one layer, ectoderm, and then they separate, you know, and, you know, so, so the skin has a lot of connection with our central nervous system. So that's something very interesting. Um, okay, so this is endocrine mind, brain, brain, mind, body connection. Don't really have time to talk too much about it, but this is how stress, you know, that for example, in the person's body and also in the mother's body affects the child also because the ho through the uh, hormones that the um, endocrine system releases. And here are the spinal cord and, and autonomic nervous system, sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system that mostly connected to the first level of the functional triune brain, the lizard brain, and the um, the uh, uh, mammalian brain, but not really the cognitive brain. So the brain, the brain-mind dyad, I like to call them dyad because it's not just the brain, it's not the mind. The brain is a physical matter, the mind is some kind of energy, kind of more of an energy, not matter, and um, they work together. If the brain is not there and we establish the brain death protocol in the hospital, for example, if somebody has a brain uh, trauma and you know they pronounce brain death, you know, the mind that particular mind is not there. We will hold that mind in our hearts, in our minds, in our thoughts, in our books, in our whatever, but that particular mind is not there. On the other hand, if somebody has if somebody's mind is disordered, for example, it's schizophrenia or some kind of dementia, the brain is shrinking. We see on MRIs that the brain is shrinking. The physical brain gets shrunk because it's not used anymore. So what are the main processes that are going on in the brain? The neuroplasticity, it's very simple. Neuro is a neurological system. Plasticity is ability to change. So neuroplasticity, some people say, I have a therapy based on neuroplasticity. Every therapy is based on neuroplasticity. Everybody, you know, neuroplasticity is not only a good guy, it is a bad guy. The repetition compulsions happen because our mind is using, you know, our brain is using neuroplasticity to change towards doing the same thing, getting with the wrong guy, getting with the wrong girl you know, doing things that we don't want to do. And we still, we know we can teach others. I worked with a person that has gambling problem. He was a professor in life and professor in teaching how not to gamble. But next time, next time he would go and gamble because he wouldn't be using his fear that he loses his wife, he loses his retirement, and he wouldn't be using his third level thinking like what, you know, how to manage, maybe I will use only $100 that I was given by the bus, you know, company to spend. He wouldn't do it, he would go all, you know, you know to broke, for broke. Um, so neuroplasticity is not just a good guy or bad guy, it's just, it is, it, that's what we're using. Neurointegration, it's also simple. Neuro is neural system. Integration, we integrate the first level, second level, third level, body-mind connection too. Neurogenesis, we, although we thought that we have certain number of neural cells, but we don't. We actually can grow neural cells, we grow neural connections, and it's not necessarily about number of neurons, it's about how many connections, how many synapses those neurons make neural circuitry and connectomes, electrochemical process, 
Our brain is an electrochemical machine, no, no more, no less, okay? The main phenomena that we all use, not just you, me, or a third person, but we all use, it's wire together, fire together principle. If two things happen at once, then next time you hear or you see that for one thing, the second thing comes to your mind and you will be reacting like those two things are happening together. So this is what it called, wire together, fire together. Um, neural pathway organization of information conduction. So we have all the same pathways. We have motor pathway. If I want to move my left toe, my right part of the motor strip will be working here and telling the toe to move, okay? Because the neural pathway are the same and everybody's sitting in this room. Um, so this is very important. It's no, none of us are unique in that sense. Synaptic pruning phenomenon, very important for learning, very important for you know, discovering things, and very important in recovery from strokes, from brain injury, from um, Parkinson, and so on. So what is pruning? You know, our, our, you know, like in neurology, they use a lot of gardening uh, metaphors because our brain is like a tree, yes? So we can grow the synapses, we can prune them. And if you, any of you is doing gardening ever, you know that we have to prune the branches that you know, are on the way of others to, 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 uh, to give like nice um, um, foliage. Don't use it, lose it phenomenon, I already said, and wire together, mature together principle. It's kind of following the first one, wire together, um, uh, wire together, fire together. So they mature together, they get, they feed off each other. So if one is maturing process, the other that was going together, it is maturing and getting better at it, um, whether good way or bad way, but it's getting better at what we're doing. Okay, so we don't have time for this. This is Eric Kendall, who got his Nobel Prize for finding um, um, how, finding the molecular mechanism of neuroplasticity and memory. You know, it's, uh, it, it is tremendous what he did. Again, neuroplasticity, again, as I said, it's not a good or bad guy. It could be good for now, and it's not forever. If you don't, you know, you know um, fuel the friendship with the, another neuron, or another system, it doesn't be, you know, it doesn't stay friends anymore. Um, and the domains of integration, um, they are brain body, mind brain, internal parts and self, memory narrative, and so on. Okay, so this is important in terms of attachment because we have the, um, you know, as I said, I use the lenses, so trauma lens, I use neurobiology lens, I use attachment lens for everything that I'm looking at. And here, uh, on the left side, we see a cartoon that is, mm, is uh, from a book by Dr. Lidu, who is at NYU uh, Neuroscience Department. He is not a psychoanalyst, although he's respecting psychoanalysis very much, and, or, but he doesn't know what he's about. He's never been in psychoanalysis himself, but he's very open to, to kind of psychoanalytic thinking. Um, but from his book, and it was not, he didn't know anything about McLean, but he developed the trauma kind of path. And can you see the resemblance on the left and on the right? The first level that, you know, reaction going through amygdala, through processing fear, and response is very fast because it's on the first floor. It's very fast and it's automatic and it's fight and flight only. And that somebody gets stuck there, they, they master that level. They master and master and master and master. And in their mind, like Selma Freiburg said, trauma demands repetition. So we repeat the trauma. One time things happen, we repeat the trauma. You know, we are the only species that repeat the trauma. Robert Sapolsky, that is a neuroscientist, wrote a book a long time ago. It was republished many times, beautiful book, um, Why Zebras Don't Have Ulcers. Because they don't repeat their trauma. 
we repeat the trauma all the time. Okay, so as you see, like on the second level, the response is slower, and on the third level, rep response is even slower, more slower, but it is more mature <coughs> response, yes, if we do it on the on integrated first, second, and third level. And um, here, if we master it and master it and master it, what happens with the second and third level? They shrink because don't use it, lose it phenomena, okay? Um, so attachment is about emotions. Like Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people would forget what you did, but people will never forget what you made them, how did you made them feel. And I don't have time for this, but those are all the beautiful books. That, you know, like I have more slides, but you know, maybe in, in the discussion if you have questions. Okay, thank you.